We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Ne olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Pent up feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Varn Blog. And today I'm with Professor Dong Ping Hun, um, who uh, wrote a book uh, about 20 years ago um on the cultural i think it was published yes. about 20 years ago yes uh, it was first, first published by uh, uh garland publishing in 2000 mm -hmm. it was republished by month review in 2008 and i i uh i read i think i first read this book when i was living um in korea because i was trying to uh learn as much as i could about um, mid 20th century China, because as an American, we were educated. I wouldn't even say we were told negative things about it. Uh, we weren't told anything about it. <laughs> um, um, you know, uh, China for, for most of us, like was, uh, something, a bunch of stuff happened in the, the end of the, <laughs> Of the, of the imperial dynasty we weren't taught anything in the 19th and then uh nixon goes to china and then people start talking about it and um from from that perspective when i was living in korea i realized that i just didn't have enough information and the the uh the the scholarship on uh the great leap forward uh and the Cultural Revolution uh, was mostly from the standpoint of, um, uh, I would say, either from a Western standpoint or from a standpoint of people who were um, very urban and I, I gather from your work very elite. Mm -hmm. um, why, why do you think that was? Why do you think so even when we get stuff from Chinese people and it's translated into English, uh, I, I don't think I saw the rural, the rural um, life portrayed hardly at all for more than like a paragraph. Uh, you know, there, is, uh, there are some Chinese uh, materials mm -hmm. on the countryside. You know, uh, Anna Lu Zhuang wrote for uh, New China. Is a magazine. He published more books about rural China, but the West never published that, uh, never introduced that into America, because there's a class interest involved here. The American elites, the American capitalists, don't want to see the positive side of the People's Republic of China after the communists came to power, and uh, that's 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 the main reason. And what American elites want to know is uh, why China became communist, right? That's their fundamental interest during the Cold War. They don't; they are not interested to see uh, China have developed well and uh, the life, uh, livelihood of the people improved. They don't want to show that. Yeah. So one thing I was always led to believe before that um, reading your book was that uh, the Great Leap Forward was mostly, um, well, frankly, it was portrayed of a catastrophe because of the focus on uh, specifically rural in industry and like village independence. And what I gathered from reading your book, which is more about the Cultural Revolution, but it made very clear that there were a lot of innovations um, 
and empowerments of rural people and, and you know, where you grew up in Jimo and, and the Shandong province, but all over in rural villages. Can you um, can you talk about the specific things that that happened in the Great Leap Forward, uh, both both as far as the positive innovations? And you do mention uh, um, that there were there were some um, mid-level officials that would, you know, uh, try to increase quotas and, and whatnot. Um, and some of that is where I think a lot of the problems that came about in the Great Leap Forward seem to have come from. But I don't think it's clear to, you know, even a, an educated uh, person here in the West, um, what, like, what, what were the specific, like, incentives causing these provincial officials to kind of amp up, you know, double quotas, uh, trying to mess with yields? Um, okay. So can you, can you talk about, and those are two separate questions. So we'll talk about the improvements first, and then we'll talk yeah. about the bureaucratic problems. Okay. Uh, let's uh, maybe from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party and fought uh, for the revolution, mostly with the help of the rural people, the Chinese rural society. And uh, in the 1920s, the 30s, when the communists were fighting for the revolution, the Chinese population were overwhelmingly rural. 90% of the people were farmers, living in the countryside. And uh, most people in the US didn't know how limited uh, arable land were there in China, very, very little land. And uh, most poor farmers in the countryside didn't have land. So famine was a common occurrence in Chinese history. When you look at the Chinese uh, Gazette, the Chinese published a local Gazette, you look through this, almost every year, there were some localized famine or natural disaster. And uh, that's very common practice, uh, co common, common, common phenomena in China, in old China. So in 1946, when the Chinese Civil War started, the Communist Party immediately started the land reform program. And I don't know, most people in the West never understand what land reform was about and what, what had, has that done for China. The land reform, I still think, I wrote a very, very long article recently about this. And uh, in response to a, a, a prophet, a, a American scholar book called Land War uh, in China. I think the, the, the land reform transformed China completely. You know, before the Chinese Communist Party came to power, uh, drug trafficking, uh, drug addiction was very, very rampant in China. I don't know the American people knew that. China is the victim of the opium trade uh, between US and British merchants and the China. And this smuggled uh, opium to China and forced China to legalize the opium. So a lot of Chinese people, particularly the rich, were addicted to opium. And uh, there were a lot of prostitutes. And in Shanghai, you said you lived in Shanghai before. Uh, before the communist coup power, Shanghai is about 2 million people. Mm -hmm. But there were more than 100,000 prostitutes in Shanghai. Okay? You give, give me another sense. Every day in Shanghai, there were 200 dead bodies were picked up in Shanghai by the social department every day. That's what China was like. People dropped dead on the streets. It's a common occurrence, 200 bodies each day on the average, okay? So that's what China was like before the communist came to power, right? Poor people's daughters were not able to survive. She so was sold to a prostitute house. And uh, it's very, very uh, miserable for the common people, right? Mm -hmm. So the communist came to power and started land reform in the countryside. And the people who left the rural area before were able to get a piece of land, right? To work on and support themselves, their family. 
So life changed immediately after the 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 the, the, the land reform in China. You know, there are many many people in, 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 even today didn't understand why China was such a stable society. Is because everybody was given a small piece of land, and on their small piece of land, they were able to grow enough for themselves and their family, and they were able to build a house for themselves, and they don't need to pay tax on this. And this is all because of the land reform, okay? And uh, after land reform, the Chinese Communist Party, through their functionary in the countryside, realized land reform itself is not enough. And because if you are you farm uh, at a pre uh, very very uh, poor conditions without the machineries without irrigations, you know it's very easy for the poor farmer to lose their land. So whenever there's a natural disaster, right, and the grain uh, price went up, and the land price went down. And the poor farmer didn't have anything else to help themselves. They often sell, often sell their land, right? So after just a couple of years in, after land reform, there were people still uh, already losing their land. So the Chinese government started said, "How would they find a way to solve this problem, to stop this uh, polarization in the countryside?" So they started in 1952, uh, called a mutual aid groups. So they arranged poor farmers to work together, right? In the beginning it was seven, eight household and they pull their resources together, help one another. When one person was sick, cannot go to uh, plant his crops, other family will help him. So that way it served as a mutual insurance for one another. Okay, this turned out to be a very big success. And uh, the countryside is, became more stabilized and the green yield increased. So the, car, the Chinese Communist Party and the government was encouraged by that uh, uh, result. So they began to promote um, a more uh, advanced collective farming. So in the beginning, they called it the lower level co-op. Lower, lower level co-op was started around 1954. And uh, it's about 30 households work together. And 50% uh, of the, uh, the, the, pro the yield were divided according to how much land you, you put into the collective. And 50% were divided according to how much you worked in the collective, right? Mm -hmm. And this was turned out to be a very big success as well. Uh, the government did a survey, uh, did, a, uh, did a survey, I think 1955, they found out about uh, 70 some percent of the lower level co-op uh, increased their yield. And about 10, uh, 11 percent and uh, maintain the same level of yield. Uh, about uh, less than 20% uh, made the loss. So in the country this size, in like China, this very encouraging, encouraging uh, achievements. So the government promoted uh, the, the lower level co-op in the whole, whole China. And by 1956, the Chinese government succeeded in uh, the socialist transformation of industry. So the Chinese uh, urban industrial enterprises all became national, mm -hmm. nationalized. Or public own ownership, meaning the production in the urban areas was accomplished. So in the countryside, uh, in part about that, the Chinese government promoted in 1956 the, the high level co ops. The high level co-ops was a much, much bigger. It's a one village as a, with one co-op. Mm -hmm. And the land was uh, basically collectivized. You no longer own your own land. You no longer own your own animals. All the animals and the land became part, public owned. And so co collectively owned. 
So you no longer divide the grain yield according to how much land and how much animals you contribute to the collective. Instead, the yield was divided according to how many people you have in your family. So 70% of the grain production were distributed to each household according to how many people you have in your family. Only 30% were divided according to how much you worked in the collective, okay? So it's a much, much high, uh, higher level uh, socialist practice, mm -hmm. right? So everybody, whether you are weak or you couldn't work, you will get enough to survive. And those who worked more will get rewarded by the 30% of the uh, distribution, okay? So that's in 1956, that's the, the high level uh, collect, uh, collective form. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1957, and uh, the Chinese government called on the whole industry to aid agriculture. And a lot of agriculture implements, uh, machineries were produced for the countryside. And I visited many, many rural villages myself. The farmer told me they were so excited about what's going on in their village. There were more implements, there were more chemical fertilizers, and the, 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 the surrounding industrial factories, uh, government offices, all try to help the rural area to produce more grain for the, for the country. And uh, so in 1958, when the Great Leap Forward took place mm -hmm. and the Chinese government was thinking about what's the best form of organization in the countryside would be suitable for the Chinese uh, new reality. So in 1958, uh, Mao was visiting some of the successful collective and, uh, in Shandong province and in Henan province. And uh, while I was in Shandong, somebody asked Mao, uh, what do you think about the communes? So the four communes will appear in Shandong and Henan. The first commune was built in, in, in Chayashan, in Henan province. But in Shandong, there's also a people, something, something called a People's commune. So mm -hmm. Mao said, People's commune is good. And the next day, the Chinese people daily carried the headline said, Chairman Mao said, People's commune was good. Well, in my home county, in my county, home, home county, Jima, mm -hmm. right? In 15 days, the whole county, 1,050 villages were all formed into communes, right? They formed mm -hmm. into about 50 communes. The commune I was in was Chongguan commune uh, with 50 villages, the Wang Wang commune. And, uh, you know, most people think the Greedy Forward was, six, was, a, was a big failure. But in fact, it was the yield in 1958 was the greatest yield ever in Chinese history at that time. The farmers produced so much that day. I mean, partly because the weather was uh, cooperative. cooperative. Mm -hmm. And another part was people worked so hard. I have interviewed so many people, the government officials, the village leaders, and everybody worked so hard in the field. I mean, my mom uh, was, uh, was a farmer. My mm -hmm. father was uh, was uh, was uh, was working for a state-owned enterprise. My father was uh, my father's factory was only about one mile from home, but he didn't come home for one for three months. Why? He was working so hard. He didn't have time to come home. And my mom worked so hard in the field, and he slept and he eat at home. And my elder sister. I had to carry my younger sister and, and dragged me along to the field to, to, to ask my mom to, to breastfeed my younger sister. 
So that's how hard the people work that, 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 that the year. So the yield was very well, very good. And uh, we had a public dining halls. And, uh, you know, people, uh, the, the, the public dining hall, a lot of people criticized that. But actually in China at that time, everybody had a public dining hall. Mm-hmm. The hospital, the school, the army, the government offices all have a public dining hall. It's something people wanted so badly because the farmer don't they don't want to come home to eat to, to cook, and they work holding in the field. They come home to cook again, so they wait there the public dining hall, and they can come to eat just like everybody else. So the public dining hall is uh, in response to the the farmer demand. That's why we had the public dining hall. So the public dining hall was uh, was trying to cook the best food they ever the the ever could. I interviewed the farmer. They said they never eat as well as in 1958 in the public dining hall. Right, the food shortage mm-hmm. was always a problem in Chinese rural area. But 1958 was such a big bumper harvest, and the farmers were able to eat very well for for that year. Right, the problem mm-hmm. is, I, I think I mentioned in my book, I wrote an article on that too, is the peop- the Chinese agriculture at that point were not able to produce enough to allow people to eat as much as they want. The Chinese people never did that before. They had to manage their food supplies very, very carefully, right? Mm -hmm. More during the busy time when they had to work hard. And the less, when there's not much to do in the field, so that's how they survived in the past. But the great leap forward changed people's perception. And they thought they already left the green shortage behind. And they could eat as much as they can now. And that's a mistake. That's a mistake of the common people. There's also a mistake of the leaders. They thought they actually entered the communism. Now they can have as much as they could. And they don't need to worry about the green shortage anymore. Okay? That's what really what happened. It's not because... Uh, I mean, they, they were having a good time. They worked hard. They were eating a lot of food. So right after the Chinese New Year, the Chinese New Year was about usually about one month late than, than, the, than the Western calendar. The Chinese were using the calendar. So usually the Chinese New Year was, uh, was February. Mm-hmm. Right after February, and the people feel they didn't have enough, right? The spring is always hard for farmers. Now they find they don't have enough to, 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 to feed everybody in the public dining hall. Mm-hmm. So they have to ration their food. Before they did it, you just come with your family. You just eat as much as you could, right? Nobody will stop you from eating as much as you want. But now they have to ration their food. So the ration in the beginning, was a little bit of, was 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 still about enough, but as as grain shortage become more severe, the rushing become smaller smaller. Okay, but the three meal a day is always there, even during the worst time, you still can come to the pub dining hall, get three meals a day, not much, maybe you need three times more or four times more to get enough. But they give you a three meal a day, a bowl of porridge, and a small bread, and some pickled vegetables, and uh, that's why I challenged the the, the Western uh, statistics about this meeting, then the number meeting people starved. That's nonsense. Okay, the food shot, the the the, the famine took place in China. I mean, there are some scholars talk about that too. It's never because of grain shortage. It's really caused by uh, maldistribution of grain supplies. The Chinese Communist Party did a wonderful job in distributing the food equally. In my book, I did talk. There are some people who eat more than their uh, fair share. 
the, the chefs, the cooks, the you know, diners, right? They get a little bit more. And uh, the wounded leaders, sometimes you get a little bit more. But it's not a big, big, big factor. It's mm -hmm. not a big factor at all. You know, old days when there were famines, it's not usually caused by anything. It's caused by the hoarding of grain by the rich people. Mm -hmm. And the rich has it, they still continue to have as much as they, they, as they wanted. It's the poor people who suffer. But during the Great Forward, the, the, the property was everybody suffered. You mean Chairman Mao suffered? Because Chairman Mao refused to eat more than his fair share. He just eat as much as other people. He stopped eating meat for six months. And so the reason why China when, uh, escaped a tremendous uh, famine is because of the socialist arrangement. Yeah, if you don't have, if you don't eat anything for seven days, you will starve to death. But the public dining hall will provide everybody three small meals every day. So you will not have enough. You will not have enough. You wouldn't have enough, but you wouldn't starve to death. That's why people were able to survive. The people who starved to death were mostly older people. Were mostly older people who are not starved exactly. Is exactly they were poor nu uh, nutrition. Gradually they were they were weakened and you might have died to disease. My grandfather on my mom's side and on my father's side both died in 1960. Yeah, when they were over 60 years old. And you cannot call them starved to death, but they died during the British forward. And uh, it's because they, 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 don't, they didn't get enough to eat. They were hungry and they were weakened by the lack of food, uh, but they died of disease. Hmm. And uh, so I think really forward, you know, most people didn't realize how much China accomplished during the really forward. I mean, the, the official figure was 84,000 big reservoirs, more than the Chinese era built throughout history. Okay. And uh, they built up their industrial base. Mm -hmm. My hometown, Jima County, uh, a county now is more than 1.2 million people. And uh, during the Great Forward, it's about 700,000 people. They didn't have any industry. But they built all together 35 factories producing far farming machineries, many, many things. Was built up during the Great Forward. Just now I told you, my father was uh, didn't go come home for three months. Mm. He was the leader of a new factory, or the better steel factory. And he recruited 3,000 workers uh, in about three months. He went to the countryside and they recruited 3,000 young people to work in his factory, okay? And uh, the factory eventually closed after the credit forward. The, the, the factory was only in operation for about three years. And uh, after the forward, the governments felt they were not able to support the factory anymore. So the 3,000 young workers recruited by my father and trained by my father had to return to their village. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you this. The reason why there are many, many statistic errors is part, is part of the reason. So when these people left the village, so officially they left, come to the urban area, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, they, they returned afterwards. So the record has some mis mis uh, calculation. That's why there are in, in Chinese stati statistics they will show uh, uh, the number of people uh, difference. That is not starved to death. They just left the village to work in the in, 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 in the urban area, and some returned, some didn't, and that's part of the the, the statistic error as well. And uh, but all this effort were well, not wasted. My father, during the Cultural years, many, many of his former workers 
right? Build village factories in their village. And they still came to my father for technical support during the cultural years. So they became seeds of industrialization in the countryside. So my father's factory was the only, only one of them. There are many, many other factories were started during the greedy forward, but the later on uh, was stopped, suspended. And the farmer, the workers went back to their former village. So there are a lot of things like that happened. Okay. And uh, so greedy forward, I mean, I, many, many years ago, when I was, uh, when I first came to the United States, I was invited to give a talk mm -hmm. at Hunter College. Mm -hmm. And uh, the topic I was uh, giving, the talk, talk of them was uh, the, the accomplishment of Greedy Forward. And uh, we, I remember I, at the time I was very, very young, very, very experienced. I walked into the, 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 the auditorium and the auditorium was filled. With, with the people. And uh, I walked in, and there's an old man, I still remember his name. And uh, his name is Dew uh, Schumann. And he introduced himself as the, the president of the US China Friendship Association. Okay, that's in 1992 uh, or 93, okay? So he said, young man, are you going to be the speaker? I said, yes. And then he yelled at me. He said, freeze it. 40 million people starve to death. You have the guts to tell us the, 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 the accomplishment of Rudy Forward? So I said, okay, let's face together. Tell me, how did you get a figure of 40 million people starve to death? And he said, I seen the, 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 we sent the best American demographer to China in 1984 uh, to study the famine figures in Gansu and the Qinghai provinces. As soon as he said that, I knew, right? What, what's going on? So I said, well, that's how you get your figure? Right, more than 20 years after the event. And did your demographer make sure the, the people he interviewed was from that was alive at that time, was uh, born at that time, right? Was so let me tell you how I figure out how many people starved to death in China. I went to the villages where the family is supposed to be the worst. I talked to the farmers in the village, everybody, about six, who was alive during the Great Forward time, right? I asked them, how many people starved to death during that time? Some people told me uh, 100. In a village of 2,000 people, 100. And some would say, oh, 50. Some would say 30, right? All kind of figures, doesn't matter. So I gather people together. After I talk to you, the way do they talk them? Get them together. Was could you please tell me the names of those people who starved? Okay, of all the people who said how many people starved, you actually can only come up with fifteen names, and all of them was past sixty years old. Okay. So you can see these people starve to death, or they just start, they just died because malnutrition. Now most people didn't know how the Chinese people's life expectancy during these years. The Chinese people's life expectancy in 1949, when the Chinese Communist Party uh, came to power, was 32 years. Only 32 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And uh, by the time more, st more died in 1976, the Chinese people's life practice was 69. More than doubled in less than 30 years. And it was 20, almost 20 years, 19 years above India. And the India started the, their life practice the same uh, as China in 1949, 32 years. But in 1976, the Chinese people's life expectancy reached 
69, and India was only 50. So that tells you something. You know, China had a great forward, and it was, in the Western eyes was a, a the catastrophe. But the Chinese people like Tenzin was, was 69 years. They were only 50. Okay? The Chinese population and the mall was also doubled. Also doubled. So in 1949, the Chinese population was most probably 400,000. By the time Mao died, the Chinese population was 800 million. There's a book in the US written by, I think, uh, uh, Terrell, right, and uh, at Harvard, it's called 800 million about China. So China, Mo was blamed by the American scholars, or Chinese scholars, for two crimes. Right? Mm -hmm. Number one was the, the greedy forward family, they, they said. At the same time, they also condemned Mo for allowing Chinese population to more than double. How could these two things, right, match? If you, if you really starve people to do that so badly, then how could the population double? Right, on the one hand. The other hand is, if the Chinese more Chinese people's life was so bad, how their life expectancy increased, doubled, right? This cannot match. Another thing that has always occurred to me is the the collectivization in in China uh, um, was much less opposed and fought over than than it was in uh, when it was attempted in the 30s in Russia, and I'd never been able to to ring that with a famine. I've been like, well, okay, if the fa I, I know there was a famine, when no one's denying that, um, but but. Um, if, if if the conditions were that bad, you would have think there would have been more political violence because there had been in a, in other communist countries when when you'd had famines. Let me and, tell you, I have a fight with my my the wiser and my American colleagues, right? Mm -hmm. I said, you know, Chinese history is a history of peasant rebellion. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Because the, the Chinese have thousands, hundreds of thousands of peasant rebellions, right? Why? The Chinese farmers and the communist rule never resort to rebelling. If the conditions were, were as bad as you claim to be, why the Chinese farmers never rebelled? And then they, they said, oh God, because they were they, they rebelled because they didn't have a guns. Right? Well, so you know, the Chinese elites never allowed farmers to have weapons mm -hmm. in history. But during most time, it's an exception. Why? The Chinese allow the Chinese government and the mall allow the Chinese farmer to have guns. Every young person in the village had a rifle because the mall was calling on the Chinese people to arm themselves. We have militias. Every village has a militia company. Every company has a militia. Uh, battling. The whole country has a division, right? A militia division. We have weapons, we have a, we have a excise of the weapon, we work in the fields while the rifle was attacked you know, beside us, right? If they want to rebel, it would be so easy. Pick up a gun and shoot the leader, they'll be rebelled. The truth of the matter is, if you want to rebel, you don't have a gun, you don't need a gun. The Chinese had a, had an old old saying called "pick up stick and rebel." Right? The Chinese created that metaphor to describe the first Chinese peasant rebellion twenty five hundred years ago. So, Jiegang Archi, you don't need a weapon to rebel if you want to rebel. So I said, apparently, without weapons is not an excuse. Right? It's all people were starved; they didn't have energy to, to rebel. Well, they have the energy to build 84,000 reservoirs, right? Why, when they come to reservoirs, build the reservoirs, they have energy. When you come to rebel, they didn't have energy. The, the truth of the matter is, the West, Western scholars 
the Western elites refused to recognize the Chinese Communist Party's rule was popular, right? Was expected by the what was expected by the Chinese farmers. They never wanted to rebel against the Communist Party. They didn't want to reconcile with that that reality. The Chinese Communist government was very very legitimate with the Chinese farmers. Because they feel everything Chairman Mao, everything the Chinese government was did was for the people's best interest. It's not for any individual interest, like in the US, right? I mean, Congress passed a law, normally it's good for the for the, the top elite, top one percent, right? Not for the majority of the people. That's just opposite in China. That's why we call the Chinese government a people's government. All the policy passed, all the laws they enforce, they enact, was in the best interest of the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people. One thing I've always found interesting, for example, we always talk about uh, here in the West the Chinese curtailing of free speech, and and one of the one of the th- which I discovered actually even in Western sources, not just in your book, was always vastly overstated in fact most of the curtailing of free speech happened under Deng Xiaoping not under uh not under Mao um and I was I remember being surprised about that and it, because it was just always drilled into us you know that that the government in in China was was hyper centralized and authoritarian and um it seems like it actually was probably the most authoritarian in the transition after after uh, after Mao died. Not. Well, I, I mean, I want to tell you this. This is very very important. I will tell you my students the same thing. You know, when Mao was alive, Mao always encouraged people to speak up against the wrongdoing of the officials, right? You know, Mao said allow Mao said. People, workers should be allowed to have a strike, and he said workers, by definition, wanted wants to work. If a worker refused to work, there must be something wrong with the management. Okay, I'm still one hundred percent agree with that statement because I was a manager myself for five years, and when you are working hard as workers. When you get paid the same way as workers, there's no reason for workers not to want to work. Only when you did something wrong, the workers resent what you did, they will refuse to work. Right? Otherwise, there's no reason for workers who don't want to work. So Mo always allowed, encouraged, allowed workers, or farmers, to write, to speak, about the wrongdoings, criticize the wrongdoings of the officials. I mean, teachers, if a teacher did something wrong, students were allowed to, to, to write big character posters to criticize the teachers. I would tell you my student, can you imagine if the college students were allowed to air their resentment against their school and administration today or their teachers? But nobody would never think about that. But in China, that's what happened. During the Cultural Revolution, during the Goody Forward, right? Young people, ordinary workers, farmers were allowed to wrote big character posters, were allowed to speak at mass meetings to criticize their managers and their bosses. And nobody were allowed to fire workers. And so I, I would argue, I mean, China was very, very much uh, close to a communist society under Mao. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of free speech. There are a lot of, see, I mean, free medical care, free education, full employment, all these benefits, right? And uh, free housing, and uh, not free, but it's very cheap. Uh, at the time, you could, you pay $1, $2 a month for, for, for a parliament, thing like that. And uh, free medical care, free education. I mean, that's the thing that all accomplished under Mao. And uh, so I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's uh, many, many Western criticisms, 
criticism by the most most era is is justified. Mm -hmm. So, I uh, one thing that I noticed when we, we we talk about the, I mean, we're kind of skipping the Cultural Revolution, and we'll so we'll, we'll track back to that. But I was I noticed how drastically the education in the rural areas degraded. I took that from your book after the Cultural yeah. Revolution. Yeah. So during the Ding Xiaoping reforms, and I, I, one of the things you mentioned was, was forcing uh, the teachers to start, basically they had to collect their own, they were taken off the work point system. Can you explain how the work point system worked and why it was such a big deal when you took okay. teachers and doctors off of it? Yeah, let me let me tell you that the 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 work point system is one of the best uh, innovation of Chinese society. It's basically take everybody's time equally, worth worth the same. Doesn't matter you are a village leader, whether you are a doctor or a teacher, you worked one hour, you get one point. You work two hours, you get two points, and these these points are worth the same amount, right? So a workers. A farmer working in the field get the same value mm -hmm. for their work than a doctor working in the doctor's office. Okay? The only difference is you work in the office, he work in the field, but the value of the work point is the same. As long as you put in one, one hour of work, you get one point. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So everybody, when you come to work, and I started working when I was nine years old. So I work on the weekend and you know, school holidays with farmers. And uh, because I was only nine years old, I was not able to do everything other people could do. I will, I will really do the light job. So I was, uh, my work point, I got a, a whole day, I got a 5.7 a day. Uh, a full grown adults, we get 10 points a day. So, um, teachers who teach in the classroom get eight hours a day, eight points a day. And uh, the barefoot doctors working in the clinic got eight, hour, eight points a day. And a farmer got eight points a day normally. But if you go to the field in the early morning and come back late, then he will get 10 points. So each day was an eight-hour day, normally. And uh, that's how the work points work. So at the end of the year, we divided the, 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 the village uh, green yield uh, into two categories, the 70% on a per capita basis. Mm -hmm. So everybody get that. The 30% were divided on the basis of how much work points your family earned over the year. So everybody's work points was tallied together and divided uh, how much your family deserve from the collective. Uh, Gray is part of it. There's also cash income. So that's how the work system, point system work. So you have to have a collective in order for the work point to work. Mm -hmm. It's our own money, right? It's a local currency, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this was ended in what, 76? 79. 79, okay. So yeah. it's not in until 79. Yeah. Um, and I was, I mean, one of the things I they always used to kind of confuse me was, um, uh, about China, about modern China, uh, contemporary China, was the healthcare system because the healthcare system, parts of it are socialized, but parts of it are not uh, now. And I knew that during the the Cultural Revolution period, you had the barefoot doctors and they were free. And I was not quite sure how they were compensated. And when your book explained the work point system, I was like, oh, oh, okay, they had like a a labor, to uh, but kind of like a labor token system that Marx yes. talks about, actually. Yeah, and yeah. and um, and when they ended that, they didn't really 
<laughs> it seems like a rural education just fell apart and yeah. and rural health kind of fell apart too. Yes. Yeah. Um uh so can you talk about the improvements uh on education and healthcare in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s? Okay. Uh the Chinese Communist Party, where they started fighting for the revolution, and uh, they made a they made a statement. They said the the, the Chinese education was not equal. And the farmers' children didn't have access to education, so they, they actually made the the, the 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 announcement they will equalize education uh, access to the whole country to the farmers. But when the Communists came to power in 1949, uh, they didn't have enough uh, experience, and they didn't have enough personnel uh, to radically change the educational system. Mm. So the education was still controlled by the old elites, educated elites, inherited by the Communist Party through the nationalist government. So they still have the, 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 the traditional uh, bias of the teachers and educators. You know, I, I wrote an article called Professional Bias. The teachers also always wanted high standard. Mm. Always wanted uh, more formal education, right? And in order to for you to enroll in the school, you have to pass exams. And in order to, for you to promote to the second next level, you need to pass exams, right? And so the Chinese government in the fifties was very very poor. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a national. They didn't have the money to to build many many schools in the countryside. So as a result, in 1950 and 1960, early 1960s, most rural children were not able to go to school. There was not enough school space. And the children cannot pass the entrance exam to be enrolled in school. And uh, during the greedy forward, the Chinese farmers and the local leaders want to change that. So they built a few more schools, uh, rural schools, but the, the natural disaster of falling in the greedy forward and the uh, green shortage, many, many schools closed down. So the cultural revolution in 1966, uh, this uh, old fight was uh, resumed. The Red Guard and the, the progressive elements in Chinese society began to uh, fight back. I think the old old style of education was not suitable for Chinese countryside, and we should allow villages, farmers, to build and manage their own schools. So, for example, before the Cultural Revolution, my village and other six villages shared one lure primary school. You don't have this in the U.S. The first lower primary school in only four years. So seven villages shared one lower primary school, four years, four grades. So each grade has one class. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to promote to the, the higher primary school, you need to pass exam. And uh, it's very hard to pass. So the majority of people will stop at the fourth grade. Okay, so as the corporation started, and each village were allowed to build their own school. So my village built a brand new school with our own resources. And the school hired new, their own teachers. So all the rural, the, uh, all the farmers' children were allowed to enter this school free of charge. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, because he's, the teacher knew the parents, knew the child in the same village, and the school was in the village. There are no reason for anybody not to go to school. Mm -hmm. If you didn't go, the teacher will come to your house, ask your parents why your child was not in school. So as a result, we have almost 100% attendance in the rural school. On top of that, 
my village with other five village build a joint middle school uh, in the next village from my school. And everybody who graduated from my pro village primary school, primary school were able to attend that joint middle school free, 100%. Okay? And uh, before the cartoon, there were only one high school in my county. During the cultural years, we built 89 high schools. When I went to high school in 1972, only 70% of my classmates were able to go to high school. The next year, when my younger sister, 1973, went to high school, 100% of his, her classmates were able to attain high school. Mm -hmm. It's how fast the school, the high school is expanding. Uh, before the country, there were only seven middle schools in the whole county. By 1976, there were 249 middle schools in the county. Basically, every farmer's children were able to attend primary school, middle school, and high school free of charge. One thing I think is often not understood about about you know uh, some of the major changes in China in the twentieth century is um, how much literacy expanded. Um, yeah. I mean, it's huge. Um, Everybody knew how to read at the time, right? And you, you look at like in the forties, uh, what less literacy? Than 10%. Uh, hmm. In nineteen forties, they're less than ten percent. Yeah, it was, it, it's very low literacy, and. Yeah. And uh, um, one of the things, that, though, that you indicated, uh, well, I've heard you speak about, is after after the um, after the seventies, like uh, turning into the to eighties, uh, um, this expansion of literacy it didn't so much stop, um, but it definitely slowed down, and rural children seem to have um, a lot less access to school above, say, primary school, so... Yeah, let me uh, tell you this, actually, <laughs> Don Xiaoping's reform produced three generations of illiterate farmers, particularly girls. Three generations in the countryside. You know, they openly said, farmers' children didn't need to read. That Don Xiaoping's government official said that. Farmers' children doesn't need a high school education, doesn't need a middle school education. And of course, many, many farmers were not afford, was, cannot afford to send their children to primary school because they charge you money. It's not free anymore. You know, in the countryside, in the urban area, is compulsory education was free. But in the countryside, even primary school, you had to pay. So many, many poor farmers didn't want to pay for their children to go to school. If their children didn't show any potential for success in education, they will pull them out. Hmm. It's very, very sad. Yeah, the, 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 the regress was so huge. Yeah, that's why I, I mean, I was proper to write this, this book, partly because in my investigation in the countryside, I was so dismayed about this this uh, this phenomenon. The farmers lost their access to education. Yeah, particularly in the, in the, in the remote uh, uh, rural area. I mean, in the in the in the in the, in the coastal area, it's a little bit better, but in the in the poor remote areas, it's a very very different story. I think it's still true today. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Why did they start charging for primary schools in rural in rural areas like like that? Because the government investment in the countryside would cut it back. Mm -hmm. okay. In most time, about fifteen percent of the Chinese national revenue was uh, investing in the in the countryside. And Deng Xiaoping government cut cut it to five percent. So they cut it. Uh, more than two thirds of the university in the countryside, so the rural teachers had, cannot get paid. 
So they have to charge students for their tuition in order to pay the teachers. So did the same thing happen in healthcare? The same thing happened in healthcare. Mm. Yeah, the, 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 the barefoot doctors, the Chinese government trained more than 6 million during the conference years. And they were all paid by work points. Now the collective disappeared. So the foundation were no longer there. So the whole infrastructure of medical care collapsed. Hmm. Yeah. You know, barefoot doctor is another important innovation of Chinese farmers. A most, most, most innovation actually. And um, it's the most, most idea, it's a most effort. And uh, the, uh, the whole national effort to train barefoot doctors for every village, two to three. So we have three million villages. And every, every village has at least two barefoot doctors. In some cases, three, some cases, four. And uh, barefoot doctors for each village. And uh, they will provide free service for the for the. That's why the Chinese life has doubled. That's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about you know the when people hear about the Cultural Revolution, they often hear about the the, the urban intellectuals and elites being forced out. Uh, into the countryside, and uh, they make it sound horrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I remember thinking, I, I, I mentioned uh, another area of the world I lived in. I, I've spent a lot more time there, actually, than in, in Asia, but I spent a lot of time in Latin America. And I, one of the things that a lot of the Latin American countries do, whatever criticisms you have of their government, they're not socialist in most cases, but um, they do, however, encourage nurses and doctors who get trained uh, by the government to go and live in rural areas. And it it really showed up during COVID. Um, uh, rural people in a lot of these countries, say Mexico, um, Peru, Bolivia, uh, n well, not as much in Bolivia, and I'm not Actually, I shouldn't say that because I was I was looking at statistics and that's that country is actually a little off. But Venezuela, et cetera, had very high rates of vac uh, vaccinations with um, mostly Chinese vaccines. Um, uh, but it was because the social trust was there between nurses and doctors like the doctor. Yes. The people know each other and they trust each other because they've been out in the community. Yes. And I, I was thinking about what effect that would have on a whole society where you kind of. I mean, it is a massive feat of social engineering and it is kind of revolutionary, but you kind of say, OK, all you different classes of people, um, all you different kinds of people, you have to live amongst each other, do what each other does, spread your skills around. Um, one of the yeah, this this seems huge. I mean, one of the things I was impressed about about you uh, in your book, and I also I've heard you speak about this, is how many different things that you were taught to do yeah. in this time period. Like, yeah. and I think it's because of this dispersal and we only hear the voices of the people who were the most elite, probably had the most to lose. And also only some of them, because we're only really hearing the people complaining about it. Like I, I haven't hold the whole, held a whole lot of stories about how good it was. And, and I just can't be like, you know, I can't, I have trouble believing that no one would have thought that it was good. Um, um, just because even in America, when you send people out into the countryside, they <laughs> often are like surprised that they don't hate that way of life. Yep. Um, um, so what, what kind of effect do you think that had on Chinese society to have, to have intellectuals and farmers having to do the same kinds of work, teaching each other their, their skills and, and spreading these skills around. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Mo is a philosopher. Uh, Mo grew up in the countryside as a farmer's boy. And uh, before he joined the revolution, he actually did a lot of uh, traveling 
in the countryside. And uh, so he always argued the educated elite need to integrate with the working class in order to be effective, right? Mm -hmm. In 19, I think, uh, 69 or 1970, when I read uh, one of Moss' uh, statement, it's good like this. The, 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 the elites are stupid. And the common people are the real smart people. At the time, I was finding it very hard to believe. How could that be true? And the people like my father, my mom, never went to school, didn't know how to read or write. And they work every day. They didn't have time to read books. How could they be smart? And the elites, on the other hand, never need to worry about getting enough to eat. And they read, they, they went to school, they read how they could be stupid. And I struggled with myself for a long time until I came to the United States. <laughs> in 1992, I was in Burlington, Vermont, and uh, cooking dinner. And I uh, saw so water tea at the same time. So uh, Bush Sr. was a companion in D.C. He went to a supermarket and uh, bought two Hershey bars. And on the way out, the cashier scanned the price in the computer. And he was so surprised. Oh, God, we can do that? So at that point, I realized why the, the elites are stupid. Because they didn't have, and everybody else knew it's a common sense knowledge. And those elites didn't know. They didn't know the cashier could do that for a long time. Right? So they were so surprised. And uh, by the common sense, everybody take it for granted. But for them, it's a big surprise. So I think the older people, common people, they had to struggle every day to get enough to eat. Right? So their struggle made them smarter for that reason. And the elites, they never need to struggle. Their need was taken care of by other people. So because they were shielded by the elite positions from the common people struggle, so they became stupid, right? I think Mo tried to transform I mean, Mo didn't hate Chinese intellectuals. Mo just needed the Chinese intellectuals had some short, shortcomings, weakness, need to be reformed. That's why Mo said that the, the urban youth, right, to join the land reform program in the 1950s. That's why in the 1960s, Mo encouraged educated urban youth to go to the countryside to learn from the farmers. And uh, of course, there are a lot of people that did. But during the cultural years alone, more than 17 million people volunteered to live and work in the countryside for many, many years. The current Chinese president, Xi Jinping, he went to the countryside when he was uh, 17 years old. He lived in the countryside for eight years. And he served as a production team leader and a village leader and eventually become a commune leader. So he, he went through that time period and learned a lot from Chinese farmers, right? And uh, this also reduced the gap between the urban and the rural people. The, the urban people bring something to the countryside the rural people didn't have. At the same time, the rural people also give the urban youth something they would never have living in the urban area. So I think this is very, very important. That's why China is much, much more successful today compared with uh, other third world countries. It's because the foundation is more la laid for China. I mean, without those helping to reform, China would have built socialism, uh, communism successfully. I mean, still, despite the setback, 
Deng Xiaoping's reform uh, cost China. China still did a much better job because of these uh, old practices. Yeah, I've I've looked at the global poverty numbers, and there, you know, you always hear people talk about the reduction of global poverty. But I've always pointed out that if you take China out, uh, there's been some yeah. very small. I mean, particularly, yeah. particularly when you the, you brought up India, India is the case point. You know, like the difference in developmental patterns uh, are kind of astounding, um, yeah. and they started at about the same level of yeah. development, um, uh, and in. I, you know, whatever one thinks of the of the contemporary uh, Chinese government, um, I will have to give uh, uh, Xi Jinping this uh, this pretty profound point. I've looked at the Gini coefficient statistics um, in China, and during the eighties and and nineties, it was you had a really high Gini coefficient. So, so there was yeah. a lot of inequity between rural, uh, rural people in particular. Um, and, and, um, um, urban professional people, you know, uh, yeah. we, um, that while it's still not ideal, um, it is lower now than the United States, for example. Yeah. Um, um, and that's happened in, I think it happened in, uh, about five years ago, and um, unlike in the United States, COVID didn't set it back. No. Um, um, so, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, society since Xi Jinping, I went to China several times and uh, studied the rural area. The the Xi Jinping changed China. Okay. Without Xi Jinping's effort. China most probably very, very big, big trouble now because China was on the verge of a peasant rebellion when Xi Jinping came to power, right, in, 19, in 2012. Mm -hmm. Before that, the Chinese farmers were angry, upset with what's going on in the country. But now the farmers were pretty happy with Xi Jinping. Because the government invested in the countryside tremendously in the last 10 years. It's significant. They built a new road, they built a new, uh, new clinic, new schools, and, uh, and they, they, they helped the poor family to, uh, to, to have a, a new uh, enterprise, so to help themselves, things like that. So the CMP was, I mean, the, his, his training. His youth, when he was living in the countryside, helped him to understand how important the countryside is. Mm. Yeah, so, I uh, I've been thinking about this in in regards to the United States, and I was actually looking at a couple of your articles on, on uh, recently on this, and and I think it does actually tie a little bit back into your book on the Cultural Revolution. Um, and there's some parts of your book we haven't got to that I would like to, but I do want to I do want to bring this up. Um, in the United States, suburban, urban, and rural people are increasingly segregated from each other. They do not oh. know each other, and they only encounter each other on the internet in a kind of ideologically hostile way. Yep. Um, I've heard good you know, left liberals in America say some things about um, about poor people in Trump country, for example, yeah. that that I find shocking. I, I grew up in, in the Deep South. Um, I uh, I was, you know, I wasn't a farmer because um, there's not a whole lot of those left here. But I know I grew up around them. And um, w every now and then I hear people, you know, say things that I'm like, how would, how do you expect uh, ever to be able to incorporate the people who make your food <laughs> into your life when you're constantly projecting upon them these political ideas that I'm not even sure they have? Yeah. Like, um, and I will say, in China in particular, but kind of in East Asia, pretty much everywhere but Japan, um, 
people are more afraid of farmers. Like, like, like you talk about this actually. You know, when farmers would show down with police in in China, yeah. the police are scared. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, in America, what happens to small farmers? And there's very, very few left. I mean, yeah. it really is uh, an almost dying profession. Yeah. Um, but uh, their, their suicide rates and whatnot are astronomical compared to everybody else's, yeah, and no. it's just not known. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, no, I was talking about this uh, with my students. You know, in America, it's where you, you, you often hear the intellectuals, the, the left progressive right faculty members, and calling the farmers redneck, right? Stupid. Wood for their oppressors, right? Mm -hmm. I always found this very, very offensive myself. You never, they never try to understand the, the farmers. They never try to understand these rural, right, people. And they have no common language with these people, right? And uh, that's where we're sad. I mean, the most effort, they try to avoid that. I mean, that's not only America, it's a whole Western European countries. The divide between the Yiddish, the educated Yiddish, and the ordinary people is huge. It's uh, astounding, right? And uh, in China, you don't see that. I, 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 I think I, I mentioned in my book, uh, or in my speech, in 1985, after I graduated, I graduated from grad school and I began to teach at Zhengzhou University. And in the fall, in, in, in winter, when the tree leaves was falling down the campus, and this college, you, in the old days with the faculty, the, the fa professors, students will collect these tree leaves, right? And, 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 uh, and compose them. But under Deng Xiaoping's government, we no longer do that. We hire the country people to sweep these tree leaves up. And uh, the, 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 the farmers who are hired to do that job, they will burn the tree leaves, and the smoke will come out, and then, and is on the whole campus. So I woke up to one of them. I said, "You know, there's a better way to dispose of this." Right? And I remember, I was the, the guy talked back to me, "Who are you to tell me how to do it? I'm the person who to do this hard work, right? You want to, you want to do it?" So I. He, he kind of yelled at me, but I feel very, very happy. Why? I said the Chinese farmers finally stood up to the educated Yiddish. Because I, I'm a professor. I should have, in the old days, I should have a right to, to lecture him. But now he lectured me. I felt so happy that day. I wrote in my diary, I said, no, Chairman Mao's cultural revolution worked. They enabled the Chinese farmer to speak back to a elite. I'm so happy for them. I, I said very softly to him, you know, there's a better way to dis dispose this. And he got upset. He had the right to, to be upset. Right? To, 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 to be told by other person how to do it. And uh, I think that part is partly because the contribution impact. So the Chinese uh, farmer, pe uh, rural people, the Chinese older people are willing to fight back to the government. But that's the hope for China and for the human, for the whole human race, right? The people, the rural class are willing to, to unite and fight back. Yeah, that, that element of China always fascinates me because on one hand you have like the all Chinese union. I have my, I, I do, I, I do have political criticisms of what it's done, but Chinese workers still strike and the government doesn't crush them. <laughs> like, like people would, 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 you know, in America would think they would. Yeah, I mean, they're I, not. I, they're not. Yeah. They, they're not. Let me tell you this. I think in 2015, Mm -hmm. There's a factory in 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 Tonghua, mm -hmm. uh, There's a special steel factory. Was sold to a capitalist, and the capitalist took over the factory, 
and it began was was about to dis, uh, dismiss a lot of workers, right? And the work had a strike. And eventually, while well, the, the captain was killed by the workers, was stabbed to death by the workers because their negotiation didn't go anywhere. And the captain was so very, very arrogant. And he was stabbed by the workers, stabbed to death by the workers. In any other country, God, the leader of the, the, the strike would be arrested, right? Or executed. But this one, not, nothing happened. Nobody was arrested. <laughs> and the government basically quietly settled the whole thing. Because they recognized the workers' uh, rights. They recognized the selling of the factory without the work consent. It's illegal. Right? And they recognized the fact the capital, what the capital did was wrong. So I think there is still some lasting uh, impact mm -hmm. of the cultural revolution. The workers were willing to stand up for their rights. One of the things I learned about in your book that I'd heard a little bit about, but not enough, was the the levels of democratization at local and municipal levels during the cultural revolution so villages and yes. and and cities really did start um uh abolishing bureaucracies and yeah. establishing uh um basically i mean the only thing i can compare it to that i know about in history is like and uh, they failed in germany but they they took over in russia this is the soviets workers councils that, that started the the ussr uh, which weren't maintained and I, I, I find it interesting that this isn't talked about that much in the context of the transition from the end of the Cultural Revolution, because the way it is generally presented to the West is it's, a, it's Mao's great consolidation of power and it fails and then Deng Xiaoping. You know, and, and when I read about these, these uh, municipal committees where you had like basically the Communist Party officialdom is, I think, what, like... Uh, frozen, and you start establishing communal government, uh, communal self government, yep. and I'm like, that doesn't, <laughs> uh, and and that and that's ended with Ding Xiaoping, like ended pretty dramatically. Yeah. So, um, can we uh, can we talk a little bit about how what those yeah. communes were and yeah. okay. how that changed society? Yeah, in 1966, December, in December, uh, in order to promote the cultural revolution as a reform and a criticize reform, right? They call it struggle, uh, criticize, criticize and, uh, and change. Mm -hmm. The Chinese Communist Party Central Committee decided to suspend the operation of the Communist Party. Right. So instead, uh, the structure, leadership structure, was uh, ordinary people formed the cultural revolution committees. So every village, every factory has a cultural revolution committee, and their job is to facilitate a struggle of the old leaders. Uh, allow people to struggle, criticize these leaders, and allow the people to air their resentment with the old management style. And the third one was to facilitate changes, how to build more ideal, more democratic management structure in the village, in the factory level. So on basis of this struggle, criticism, and uh, discussion of uh, uh, new structure, political structures, uh, came up with revolution committee. So every village, every factory, every county, every province set up a revolution committee. And instead of communist party uh, cadres, right? So this 
revolution committees uh, were formed uh, three parts. Now there's some senior staff, and uh, there are middle-aged uh, staff. Uh, there is younger uh, component, so called Lao Zhongxing. The three age group had to be represented in the committee. And in the county level, you have to be farmers, you have to be workers, there had to be some soldiers, three group, right? So called San Jiehe, three elements combined, an age combination and a professional combination. And in the village, of course, mostly farmers. So there are middle-aged farmers, older farmers, younger farmers were represented in the committee. And uh, the new thing is also another important thing is a is a is a work is a leaders participate in many many labor. So every work every leaders in the village in the committee working committee had to work like uh, all the farmers every day. Meetings can be held, but at night, not during the day. And in the factory, uh, the 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 management had to participate in labor, manual labor, and the workers participate in management and uh, reform the unreasonable rules and the regulations. And the three, the last three things called three cooperation. So management, workers, and the technic, technical staff, engineers, cooperate to get things done. So they are build a community. It's no longer divided by social classes. Or management only work in the office, tell workers what to do. No, it's no longer like that. It's the management come to the factory work with the workers and discuss how they should work together to get things done. So it's no longer a divided, right? Mm -hmm. Organization. It's a, a bill, it's a community. Everybody work together to solve the problem and to get things done. I would. I was a manager myself. I mean, I I I used, I used to tell my students, I go to work half an hour early than everybody. I left work half an hour late than everybody. I got to pay the same. Right? I got to pay the same. But I always think that's the best way to guard to to lead. When you work as hard as others, when you don't take as uh, more than others, you get respect, right? You get respect. And the people, the workers no longer think you were the oppressor. They consider you one of them. There's no reason for them not to work with you to get things done. Because everybody's interested to bond together. And I, I think that what we miss in the US, we don't have a community. We don't have a community. And uh, we all have employees and the, the, the managers. And each class, each group has their own self special interest. They don't trust each other. But during most time, God, we trust each other. We knew we are, we are, we are in the same boat together. Our best interests were bound together by, by the, the organization, by the community. Yeah, I think I think that's the I really think that's the real, real democracy at work. Is mm -hmm. not what we have we just have every have an election every four years. It, it's it's not like that. Yeah, we, we elect our own leaders. We do. We elect our uh village leaders, we elect our production team leaders, but we are not just elect them. We are oversee them every day on a daily basis. If we have some opinion, we tell them right away. So I don't think we have this kind of intimate uh, working together in the U.S. society. No. Yeah. 
I, I what I find interesting about this it, it, there's a kind of Orientalism you'll hear out of out of uh, Western scholars. That sometimes people even uh, I got this more from when I lived in Korea than in China, but they'll even play up to that the idea that the society is just inherently more collectivist because whatever reason and uh i think there's some of that in like our ideological narratives and our narratives about community that's absolutely true but i i don't um i think most of this stuff actually comes from the practical experience of having to go through these things together i don't think it, it it's like just just ideology just something about confucianism or something you might always hear uh, I, you know, and I think it's, I think it's telling um, that social trust is so high in China right now. It was very high in, in the seven, in the, in the seventies actually. Um, but it also did, I remember hearing about this a lot when I was living in Korea, but, but um, particularly in like 2009, 2010, it seemed like there was a, a little bit of a danger in that time period during the, 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 the presidency of Hu Jintao, uh, that that social trust was beginning to erode in China. That seems That's to have right. been reversed. But... I mean, as you see, you know, the reason we had the Tiananmen Square incident is mm -hmm. where we're telling the, the Deng Xiaoping's government was abandoned by the Chinese people. They no longer have any hope for them. You know, in 1989, we almost overthrew them. You see what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, it's yeah. funny because because people people think I, I always remember reading uh, in America that and then they talk about Tiananmen Square and they think, you know, they're fighting for democracy, but by democracy, what the Westerners mean by that is capitalism. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't believe they were fighting for yeah. capitalism yeah. at all. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was writing about this in the in recently. I said, it. the Tiananmen Square in 1989, the Chinese government made three stupid mistakes. Number one. They abandoned the workers, farmers. So in the eyes of the majority of the people, they lost legitimacy. Number two, they allow the Western scholar to, to teach in China, right? The color revolution, to infiltrate the Chinese universities. So that is really, really, uh, the Western, I think CIA and many, many Western effort Right in a, in a way, went over these young people in college to their side. So there was a group of student leaders who were westernized. Okay, and number three is so that the officials themselves became very very corrupt, and so the three things combined to produce the the culture the, the Times Square incident. And uh, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin didn't pay attention to this. They continued for another 20 years. And when Xi Jinping came to power in 19, 20, 20, 2012, he realized the problem. He gradually right, uh, reclaimed the territory lost by uh, Dong's reform. And that's the reason why many, many people in China and uh, we're happy with the Xi Jinping, but there's also a small number of people in China who are very, very much hated Xi Jinping for what he has done. Because China was going back to most, <laughs> most uh, policies. Yeah, there's, I mean, we, we live in class societies, and we, we, we always be divided. You cannot get 100% people behind you. But in China today, with Trump's help, with the help of the U.S. government, the Chinese people today is more united than ever since Deng Xiaoping's reform. Okay. One of the things that I uh, I, I follow, you know, I, I, I used to work in international education, and um, uh, I was I was one of the few people who was happy in it when I heard about the reforms that. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping was pushing on the the private um, international education sector uh, because, I mean, you, you probably know this, but during the uh, during the eighties up and through probably about two thousand and fifteen, 
uh, China had the reputation in international education as kind of the wild east. Like you'd have these private schools that were throwing yes. huge amounts of money at people. Yes. Um, and uh, um, and they were they were educating these very very elite uh, Chinese children of of mostly business people. Yeah. Um, but those schools were. <laughs> How do I put it? Um, often, I mean, they felt they they often felt to me like uh, like uh, they were almost not scams, but but just barely not. And so I, when 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 the, the reforms passed, and I knew a lot of people in the international school community, and they were worried about it. I'm like, I think it's kind of good, actually. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I, uh, because I mean, even, I mean, even Western teachers would sometimes get screwed over by these schools. And I'm just like, I'm like, we don't want them just <laughs> unregulated. You don't want them anywhere. We wouldn't want that in our own country either. Yeah. Like, um, uh, and I mean, we have some of those problems in our own country with actually mostly with religious schools more than yeah. foreign schools, but, yeah. but, but, uh, it's it's something that i can get i can get behind that i um hmm, i i do think it's sometimes very hard for um for for westerners probably more than the other way around actually uh to completely understand what is going on in China, even when you're there, I mean, um, when you're there, it's you know, particularly if you're in a major city, it's like a major city, and you, you don't speak the language, and and, and usually, um, uh, Mandarin is uh, actually didn't seem that hard to to learn how to speak it, although I yeah. don't, but <laughs> learning how to read it was really intimidating. Yeah, um, yeah. um, but uh, uh, I um. Um, I, I I do think there's a lot of misunderstanding right now, particularly between um, uh, Westerners and and Chinese people. And I think, unfortunately, this has been been seized on by both political parties for different reasons. Yeah. Um. But in it, it it worries me because I do really believe. <laughs> That um, no matter what we think about our our governments, and I'm not super fond of either of the parties that we have here, no. um, but um, that China and and the United States and Europe and all the developed nations, and I think we can safely say that China is one is is the developed nation now. Actually, no. um, uh we have a responsibility to the world to work together because we have a lot of climate stuff that this is that... what i agree uh, this is what i think we should yeah the misunderstanding i think uh it's uh, it's uh, because the government want that happening but the u.s government american media's portrait of china is ridiculous right they are looking for the the, the they are speaking on the negative things in china they never talk about the positive thing in China. I mean, I wrote an article one time. I wrote see the Chinese love America, right? I worried me sometimes. But now the, the time changed because what Trump did to, to, to China make me Chinese people to wake up America and harm, uh, harbor uh, evil intentions about China. Uh, they don't think they, they want to treat China as equal. And uh, they have a racist, racist uh, connotation in their politics with China, right? Yeah, we cannot allow China, uh, a different culture, to, to, to rise over us. Sometimes they make it sound like they were, they were the God choosing people. China was not, right? And the China should never be allowed to, to be equal, equal with, you, with the West. And that kind of things, I think, is is very hard for Chinese, you know, for the elites, for the people who are for America, mm -hmm. in Greece. Yeah. Well, I uh, 
I mean, I, I am I am deeply concerned about it actually because yeah. it, it's it's something that, um, I think no matter what anyone in the U.S. does, um, China is the number one manufacturing power on the planet. It, yes. It, um, yeah. its GDP will eclipse ours. Or actually, does many years now. Actually, like depending on the year, I think we I think U.S. is third in GDP if you consider Europe as a whole, China. Um, and sometimes Europe and the U.S. go back and forth, but we have to treat um, China as as equals. I mean, I believe this. Uh, I, I I'm an internationalist. I believe we should treat everybody actually. But 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 no. Even practically, even if I take that ideology ideology away and just put on completely practical goggles, I've been sort of gobsmacked. Not by Trump. I expected that from Trump. <laughs> I have been gobsmacked by it continuing off and on under Biden and yep. and uh, and the Democrats and this general anti-Chinese, anti-Asian undertone to a lot of what is going on in the media. No, I mean, no society is perfect, but but uh, I, I do. Th- I don't even think most Americans understand what's going on in China. Like, like when people are like, well, it's not a democracy. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I mean, what do you mean by that? <laughs> I mean, like, like, like our elected, I can show you a study that says our elected officials pretty much ignore public opinion. <laughs> like, yeah. nor, you know, we get to get to pick one of two parties and those parties are enshrined into law in most states. And our system has been made so un- so complicated that nobody can even get a handle to even begin to reform it. So, so I mean, what does that even mean? <laughs> I mean like yeah. in our case, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I do, I worry about this a lot because because of particularly climate change, yeah, and um, uh, I will. I will say I've been I've been impressed actually in some ways with certain Chinese initiatives to handle that but I do fear that without international co- cooperation it will not be enough. Um, um and so I think we do need to understand that. I actually do think understanding the cultural revolution in particular um uh and not you know I don't think anyone would say that everything that happened in the cultural revolution particularly in some of the cities was ideal but it does seem like that 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 sense of everybody working together people getting you know in the same having the same general interest people you know yes there are still so there were still social classes in china but those tensions were greatly reduced and people really were i mean a manager was a worker it's just a specialized kind of worker. Yeah. Um, and that, I don't see that even in the American left right now. Like I'm not, you know, there's a lot of talk about in the Americas. Finally, people are talking about the working class um, in the United States. But but even when they talk about it, um, I feel like they're talking about the 1950s actually. And like, they don't even know what, non-educated uh labor is like or what it even is yeah. um they're that removed from it yeah. and i do think that's driving a lot of the in, the seeming intractability and insanity in our politics and that also i think a lot of people think that maybe using fear of uh, of, of a great foreign power will will be a unifying factor and so far it hasn't been so even if they're trying to do it cynically i don't think it's going to work no, <laughs> yeah, you are more educated today, <clears throat> right? Mm-hmm. The young people today is more educated, in more information, more easily available. I think that that will be the hope for the future. The younger generation will not just listen to the media and, uh, and believe in it. They have a critical thinking skills today. Most of them, I think, right? And uh, I think, I think, uh, a younger generation are more willing to cooperate with uh, other countries for the sake of the environment. 
Mm, yeah, I, 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 I really hope so because it, it's, um, that's. I think the biggest lesson I learned from your book, other than the corrections of you know, kind of biased our our, um, incomplete history, was that, um, we really need people in the United States to start moving between different social classes and age groups. Yeah. We desperately need it. I think and... we need to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, the country, the culture that will be able to do that will be the winner, right? Mm -hmm. And a human race cannot survive like this. The top 1% owns as much as 90% on the bottom. That cannot stand. And uh, I think our environmental uh, crisis will force us to re-examine our social structure, right? And I think I think there are a lot of ways to solve that problem. But the problem in the U.S. is, uh, I think the Chinese government can do that much, much easier. And uh, in a way, the Chinese government could, easy, could take the wealth from the rich. And forcefully, the U.S. cannot do that. And uh, I think, therefore, that part, I think China most probably will be able to solve the reduce the gap between rich and poor much, much easier than the U.S. can. We have a large share of state-owned enterprises. And uh, the government could tax the rich uh, much, much easier than the U.S. can. You know, Jack Ma in China and a lot of rich people, right? Used to be very arrogant, right? Now they were, they have to keep a low profile because the government is scrutinized them. And the government is, 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 is uh, take action, right? And the Chinese government is talking about the common wealth, common prosperity. And uh, the Chinese Communist Party was founded on that platform. And uh, I think that's, that's good development in uh, under Xi Jinping. Hmm. Yeah, I hope he got, uh, he got re-elected and uh, continue another 10 years. Then he might be able to solve many, many of the Chinese problems. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time, for, um, Professor Han, and I really appreciate it, and I hope my listeners appreciate it as well. Um, um, People should definitely go read your book, The Unknown Cultural Revolution. Um, <coughs> it's pretty reasonable uh, in ebook form as far as price goes uh, for an academic book. And so uh, uh, check it out. Um, and uh, uh, they should also look at some of your articles. I think they are helpful in understanding some of the differences in perspective. Um, so thank you for your time and have a great day. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.